The ingenious Hidalgo Don Quixote de la Mancha Miguel Cervantes Tasa I, Juan Gallo de Andrada, notary of the King's Chamber our Lord, of those who reside in his council, certify and attest that having seen by the lords of him a book entitled The Ingenious Hidalgo de la Mancha, composed by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, valued each sheet of said book at three and a half maravedis, which has 83 sheets, which at the said price mounts the said book 290 maravedis and a half, in which it is to be sold on paper, and they gave a license so that it can be sold at this price, and they ordered that this rate be placed at the beginning of said book, and it cannot be sold without it. And, for the record, I gave this in Valladolid, on the twentieth day of the month of December 1604 years. Juan Gallo de Andrada. Arata testimony This book has nothing worthy that does not correspond to its original. In testimony of having been correct, I gave this fee. In the College of the Mother of God of Theologians of the University of Alcalá, on December 1, 1604. Mr. Francisco Mercia de la Lana. The King since on your part, Miguel de Cervantes, we were informed that you had composed a book entitled The Ingenious Hidalgo of La Mancha, which had cost you a lot of work and was very useful and profitable. You asked and begged us to send you give license and faculty to be able to print, and privilege for the time that we were served, or as our grace was, which, seen by those of our council. Since in the said book the procedures that the primatic recently dated us about the printing of the books were made, it was agreed that we should have this certificate of ours given to you, in said reason. And we had it for good. For which, to do you good and mercy, we give you license and power so that you, or the person that your power may have, and not any other, can print the said book, entitled The Ingenious Hidalgo of La Mancha, which has become obsolete. Mention is made, in all these our kingdoms of Castile, for a time and space of ten years, which run and accounted from the said day of the date of our document under pain that the person or persons who, without having your power, print or sell it, or have it printed or sold, for the same case, lose the print they make, with the molds and rigging of it, and more, he incurs a penalty of 50,000 maravedis each time he does otherwise. Which said penalty is one third for the person who accuses him, and the other third part for our chamber, and the other third part for the judge who sentences him. Provided that every time you have the said book printed, during the time of the said ten years, you bring it to our council, together with the original that was seen in it, which each page is initialed and signed at the end of the day. Of Juan Gallo de Andrada, our chamber notary, of those who reside in it, to know if the said printing is in accordance with the original, or you bring faith in public form of how by a broker appointed by our mandate, said printing was seen and corrected by the original, and it was printed according to it, and the errata pointed out by it remain printed, for each one of those books that thus are printed, so that the price that you may have for each volume may be appraised and we order the printer to print the said book in this way, not to print the beginning or the first sheet of it, nor deliver more than one book with the original to the author, or person at whose expense he prints it, or to any other, for the purpose of the said correction and value, until before and first said book is corrected and valued by those of our council, and, being done, and not otherwise, you can print the said principle and first document, and successively put this our certificate and the approval, tax and errors, under pain of falling and incurring the penalties contained.
in the laws and pragmatics of these our kingdoms. And we order those of our council, and any other justices of theirs, to keep and comply with this our document and what is contained in it. Date in Valladolid, 26 days of the month of September 1604 years. I, the king, by order of the king our lord, Juan de Ramezcuerta, to the Duke of Beja, Marquis of Gibralian, Count of Benalcazar y Banes, Viscount of La Puebla de Alcosa, Lord of the towns of Capilla, Curiel and Berguelos in faith of the good reception and honor that your excellency gives to all sorts of books, as prince are inclined to favor the good arts, especially those that due to their nobility do not fall to the service and magnificence of the vulgar. I have determined to bring to light the ingenious Hidalgo Don Quixote de la Mancha, under the clear name of your excellency, whom with the respect that I owe to such greatness, I beg you to receive him pleasantly under his protection, so that in his shadow, although naked of that precious ornament of elegance and erudition that the works that are composed in the houses of men are usually dressed in, that they know, Surely it would seem in the judgment of some who, not remaining within the limits of their ignorance, tend to condemn the works of others with more rigor and less justice, your Excellency's prudence looking at my good desire, I am confident that you will not disdain the shortness of such humble service. Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra Prologue Unemployed Reader. Without oath you can believe me that I would like this book as a child of understanding, to be the most beautiful, the most gallant and most discreet that could be imagined. But I have not been able to contravene the order of nature, that in it each thing engenders its like. And sir, what could my sterile and ill-cultivated ingenuity engender, if not the story of a dry, hazel, whimsical sun full of various thoughts and never imagined by anyone else, just like someone who was engendered in a prison, where all discomfort has his seat and where all sad noise makes his room. The calm, the peaceful place, the amenity of the fields, the serenity of the skies, the murmuring of the fountains, the stillness of the spirit are a great part so that the most sterile muses show themselves fertile and offer births to the world that fill it with wonderful and happy. It happens that a father has an ugly and graceless son, and the love he has for him puts a blindfold on him so that he does not see his faults, rather he judges them for discretion and niceties and tells his friends for wits and graces. But I, who, although I look like a father, am Don Quixote's stepfather, do not want to go along with the current of use, or beg you, almost with tears in my eyes, as others do, dear reader, to forgive or hide the faults that in this my son sees. Well, you are neither his relative nor his friend, and you have your soul in your body and your free will as the most painted, and you are in your house, where you are lord of it, like the king of its alcabalas, and you know what is commonly said, that under my mantle, I kill the king. All of which releases you and frees you from all respect and obligation. And thus, you can say everything you like about the story, without fearing that they will slander you for the evil or reward. You for the good that you say about it. I would only like to give it to you, peeled and naked, without the ornamentation of a prologue, nor of the innumerability and catalogue of the usual sonnets, epigrams and praise that are usually placed at the beginning of books. Because I can tell you that, although it cost me some work to compose it, none of me had to make this preface that you are reading. Many times I took the pen to write, and many times I put it down, not knowing what I would write, and, while I was in suspense, with the paper in front of me, the pen in my ear, my elbow on the desk, and my hand on my cheek, thinking about what I would say, 
a friend of mine, gracious and knowledgeable, came in at the wrong time, who, seeing me so imaginative, he asked me the cause, and, not concealing it from him, I told him that I was thinking of the prologue that he had to write to the story of Don Quixote, and that I was lucky that I didn't even want to do it, much less bring to light the deeds of so noble a knight. Because, how do you want me not to be confused by what the ancient legislator they call the vulgar will say when he sees that, after so many years that I have slept in the silence of oblivion, I now leave, with all my years on my back, with a legend as dry as Esparto grass, oblivious to invention, diminished in style, poor in concepts and lacking in all erudition and doctrine, without annotations in the margins and without annotations at the end of the book, as I see that there are other books, even if they are fabulous and profane, so full of sentences from Aristotle, Plato and the whole group of philosophers, who admire the readers and do they consider their authors to be well-read, erudite and eloquent men. So what, when they quote the divine scripture, they will only say that they are St. Thomas Thomas and other doctors of the church, keeping in this such ingenious decorum, that in one line they have painted a distracted lover and in another they make a Christian sermon which is a joy and a gift to hear or read it. My book must lack all of this, because I don't have anything to delimit in the margin, nor what to write down at the end, nor even less do I know which authors I follow in it, to put them at the beginning, as everyone does, with the letters of the ABC, beginning in Aristotle and ending in Xenophon and Zoilo or Zeuxis, although the one was a cursor and the other a painter. My book must also lack sonnets at the beginning, at least sonnets whose authors are dukes, marquises, counts, bishops, ladies, or famous poets, although, if I asked two or three official friends for them, I know they would give them to me, and such that those of those who have more names in our Spain would not equal them. In short, my lord and friend, I continued, I determine that Mr. Don Quixote remains buried in his archives in La Mancha, until heaven provides someone to adorn him with as many things as he lacks, because I find myself incapable of remedying him, due to my insufficiency in few letters, and because naturally I am lazy and lazy to go looking for authors who say what I know how to say without them. From here is born the suspension and elevation, friend, in which you found me. It is enough cause to put in it what you have heard from me. Hearing which my friend, slapping his forehead and bursting into a burst of laughter, said to me, By God, brother, now I have just been undeceived from a delusion that I have been in all the time. That I have told you about. I know in which I have always considered you discreet and prudent in all your actions. But now I see that you are as far from being it as heaven is from earth. How is it possible that things of so little moment and so easy to remedy can have the strength to suspend and absorb an ingenuity as mature as yours, and so made to break and run over by other greater difficulties? To faith, This is not born from a lack of ability, but from excess of laziness and lack of speech. Do you want to see if what I say is true? Well, pay attention to me and you will see how, in the twinkling of an eye, I confuse all your difficulties and remedy all the faults that you say that. Suspend and intimidate you from bringing to light the world the story of your famous Don Quixote, light and mirror of all the night errantry. Tell me, I replied, hearing what he was saying, how do you intend to fill the void of my fear and reduce the chaos of my confusion to clarity? To which he said, the first thing that you notice about the sonnets, epigrams, or eulogies that you lack for the beginning, and that they are of serious and titled characters, 
can be remedied in that you yourself take some trouble to make them, and later you can baptize them and put the name you want, Godsonum to Presta Juan de las Indias, or the Emperor of Trabasonda, of whom I know that there is news that they were famous poets, and when they have not been and there are some pedants and high school graduates who bite you from behind and murmur this truth, do not give them two Maravedis, because, once they find out the lie, they will not cut off the hand with which you wrote it. As for quoting in the margins the books and authors from which you will extract the sentences and sayings that you put in your history, there is nothing else but to do, so that it comes to your hair. Some sentences or Latin that you know by heart, or, at least, that they cost you little work to find him, as it will be to put, trying to freedom and captivity, non bene pro toto libertas. Vendicia oro. And then, in the margin, quote Horace, or whoever he said it to. If you are dealing with the power of death, go later with, pallida mors equo pulsat pede pauperum tiburnas, regumcu turras. If from the friendship and love that God commands to be shown to the enemy, enter immediately through the divine scripture, that you can do it with a certain amount of curiosity, and say the words. At least, of God himself, ego autumn deco vobus, fill in initial vestros. If you are dealing with bad thoughts, go with the gospel, decord exient cogitation amali. If from the instability of friends, there is Cato, who will give you his couplet, Donic eris Felix, multos numeribus amicos, tempora si ferint nubila, solus eris. And with these Latinos and others such they will even consider you a grammarian, for to be one is not of little honor and benefit today. As regards putting annotations at the end of the book, surely you can do it this way. If you name a giant in your book, make it the giant Golias, and with only this, which will cost you almost nothing. You have a great annotation. Then you can put, the giant Golias, or Goliath, was a Philistine whom the shepherd David killed with a great stone in the valley of Terebinto, according to what is told in the book of Kings, in the chapter that you will find that is written. After this, to show you a learned man in human letters and a cosmographer, do as in your history the Targus River is named, and you will see yourself later with another famous annotation, putting the Targus River was said so by a king of Spain. He was born in such a place and died in the ocean sea, kissing the walls of the famous city of Lisbon, and it is opinion that it has the golden sands, etc. If you talk about thieves, I'll tell you the story of Caco, I know it by heart. If of harlot women, there is the bishop of Mondonado, who will lend you Lamia, Leda and Flora, whose note will give you great credit. If cruel, Ovid will give you Medea. If of enchanters and witches, Homer has Calypso, and Virgil Circe. If of valorous captains, Julius Caesar himself will lend you himself in his commentaries, and Plutarch will give you a thousand Alexanders. If you treat love, with two ounces that you know of the Tuscan language, you will run into Leon Hebrio, who swells your measurements. And if you don't want to travel to foreign lands, in your house you have Fonseca, del Ama de Dios, where everything that you and the most ingenious person will be able to wish in such matter is encrypted. In resolution, there is nothing else but that you try to name these names, or touch these histories in yours, which I have told here, and leave the charge of putting the annotations and annotations to me, that I vote for you to fill in the margins and spend four sheets at the end of the book. Let us now come to the citation of the authors that the other books have, that in yours you lack. The remedy for this is very easy. 
Because all you have to do is look for a book that covers them all, from A to Z, as you say. Well, you will put that same alphabet in your book. That, since the lie is clearly visible, because of the little need you had to take advantage of them, nothing matters, and perhaps there will be some so simple that he believes that you have taken advantage of all of you in the simple and simple history of yours. And, when it serves no other purpose, at least that long catalogue of authors will serve to give the book unexpected authority. And more, that there will be no one to find out if you followed them or not, not doing anything about it. Even more so, although I realize it, this book of yours does not need any of those things that you say it lacks, because all of it is an invective against the books of chivalry, of which Aristotle never remembered, nor did he say nothing San Basilio, nor reached Cicero, nor do the punctualities of the truth, nor the observations of astrology, fall below the count of their fabulous nonsense. Nor are geometric measures of importance to him, nor the refutation of the arguments of those who use rhetoric, nor does he have any reason to preach to anyone, mixing the human with the divine, which is a kind of mixture that no Christian understanding should put on. He just has to take advantage of imitation in whatever he is writing, that the more perfect it is, the better will be what is written. And, since this writing of yours does not aim at more than undoing the authority and place that books of chivalry have in the world and in the common people, there is no reason for you to go around begging sentences from philosophers, advice from divine scripture, fables from poets, prayers of rhetoricians, miracles of saints, but to ensure that your prayer and resounding and festive period come out plainly, with significant, honest and well-placed words, painting, in everything that you reach and possible, your intention, making your concepts understand without intricate and obscuring them. See also that, reading your story, the melancholic is moved to laugh, the laughing one increases it, the simple does not get angry, the discreet admires the invention, the grave does not despise it. nor the prudent stop praising it. Indeed, keep your sights set on demolishing the ill-founded machine of these chivalrous books, hated by so many and praised by many more, that if you achieved this, you would not have achieved little. With great silence I was listening to what my friend was saying to me, and his reasons imprinted on me in such a way that, without putting them in dispute, I approved them as good and I wanted to make this prologue about them, in which you will see, gentle reader, the discretion of my friend, my good fortune in finding such a counsellor at a time so needed, and your relief in finding so sincere and so straightforward the story of the famous Don Quixote of La Mancha, of there is an opinion, by all the inhabitants of the Campo de Montiel district, that he was the most chaste lover and the bravest gentleman that for many years now was seen in those surroundings. I do not want to make you more expensive for the service I render you in making you known as such a noble and honorable knight, but I do want you to thank me for the knowledge you will have of the famous Sancho Panza, his squire, in whom, in my opinion, I encrypt all my squire's graces. That in the crowd of vain books of chivalry are scattered. And with this, God give you health, and don't forget me. Okay. To the book of Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha Urganda the Unknown if you get to the good, book, you go with Letu, the mouth will not tell you that you don't put the de well. But if the bread is not covered by going into the hands of an idiot, you will see from hands to bow, even not giving one in the class, although they eat the ma to show that they are curious. And, 
Since experience taught that he who approaches a good tree good shade covered him. In Baha your good fortune a real tree offers you that gives princes for fruit, in which a duke flourished is new Alejandro Ma. Comes to his shadow, which dares favors fortune. Of a noble Manchi Hidalgo you will recount the adventures, to whom idol let to upset the head, ladies, weapons, knight, they provoked him so, that, like Orlando furious, tempered to fall in. Love. Reached to strength of bra to Dulcinea del Tobo. No indiscreet hieroglyph stamps on the ESCU, which, when it is all figu, with dastardly points are sent. If I humiliated you in the direction, someone will not say, mockingly, what Don Alvaro de Lu, what Anibal the Carter, what King Francisco in Spain complains about fortune. Well, Heaven would not like you to come out as lardy like the black one lati, to speak Latin I shunned. Do not blunt me with a needle, nor plead with a sharp edge, because, twisting the bow, the one who understands the law will say, not a span of the oar, why with me flow. Do not get involved in dibu, nor in knowing lives of Ajay, that, in what does not go or see, Passing by is san. That they usually caper give them to those who grace. But you burn your zeal only in collecting good fa. Than the one who prints nonsense Dallas to perpetuate census. Warns that it is unwise. Since the tile is made of glass. To take stones in the hands to throw at the neighbor. That the one who brings to light pape to entertain twelve he writes foolishly and low. Amadista Gaula to Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha Sonnet U, who imitated the tearful life I had, absent and scorned on the great slope of the Peña Pobre, from joyful to reduced penance, you, to whom the eyes gave the drink of abundant liquor, although salty, and raising silver, tin and copper, gave you food on earth, live sure that forever, as long as, at least, that in the fourth sphere, his horses. Goad the blonde Apollo, you will have a clear reputation for courage. Your homeland will be the first in all, your wise author, to the world one and only. Don Bellianus of Greece to Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha sonnet I broke, cut, dented, and said and did more than in the night errant orb. I was right-handed, I was brave, I was arrogant, I avenged a thousand wrongs, I undid a hundred thousand. I gave feats to fame that it eternalizes. I was restrained and gifted lover. Everything giant was dwarf for me, and I satisfied the jewel at any point. I had fortune prostrate at my feet, and she brought my sanity from the forelock to the bald occasion to the astricote. More. Although my fortune was always encumbered on the horn of the moon, I envy your prowess, O oh great Quixote. Lady Oriana to Dulcinea del Toboso Sonato, who would have, beautiful Dulcinea, for more comfort and more rest, put Miraflores in El Toboso, and exchange his London with your village. Oh. Who of your desires and livery will adorn soul and body, and of the famous knight that you made? Fortunate will watch some unequal fight. Oh! Who would escape from Sonor Amadus as chastely as you did from the restrained Hidalgo Don Quixote? That she would be envied like this, and not envy, and be happy the time that was sad, and enjoy the tastes without cleavage. Gandaline, S Q U A R E M A N of Amadista G A U L A to Sancho P A N Z A S Q U A R E M A N of Don Quixote Sonnet Hail, famous man, whom fortune, 
when she placed you in the squire's treatment, arranged it so softly and sensibly, that you passed it without any misfortune. The hoe or the sickle is little repugnant to the walking exercise. The squire's plainness is already in use, with which I accuse the arrogant who tries to trample the moon. I envy your donkey and your name, and equally envy your saddlebags, which showed your same providence. Hail again, O oh Sancho! Such a good man! That to only you our Spanish Ovidio with Buzz Corona makes reverence to you. Del Dionoso. E N T R E V E R A T E D poet. To Sancho P A N Z A and R O C I N A N T E I am Sancho Panza, shield from Manchego Don Quijo. I put feet to dust, for living at discretion that the unspoken Valady all his reason for this encrypted in a withdrawal, according to Celeste, book, in my opinion, divvy if he covered more. The humor, to Racinant I am Racinant, the famous great-grandson of the great baby. For sins of weakness, I went to the power of a Don Quijo. Couples I ran to the flow. More, for Carba's claw. I did not escape fattening. That I got this from Lazari when, to steal the vi from the blind man, I gave him the par. Orlando furious to Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha sonnet if you're not even, you haven't had him either. What a peer you could be among a thousand peers, nor can there be where you are, I invite winner. Never defeated. I am Orlando, Quixote, who, lost by Angelica, I saw remote seas, offering to fame on their altars that value that oblivion respected. I can't be your equal. That this decorum is due to your prowess and your fame, since, like me, you lost your brains. But be it mine, if to the arrogant more and quote fierce Domus, who today calls us equals in love with bad success. The Knight of Febus to Don Quixote of L.A. Mancha Sonnet Your sword was not equaled by mine, Spanish Phoebus, curious courtier, nor to the high glory of valor my hand, which lightning was where the day is born and dies. Empires one despised. I left the monarchy that the Red Orient offered me in vain, to see the sovereign face of Claridiana, my beautiful dawn. I loved her by a unique and rare miracle, and, absent in his misfortune, hell itself feared my arm, which tamed his rage. But you, Goth Quixote, illustrious and clear, through Dulcinea you are the eternal world, and she, through you, famous, honest and wise. From Solistan to Don Quixote de L.A. Mancha Sonnet Magua, Senor Quixote, what nonsense you have the cerebello collapsed, you will never be reproached by someone for home of vile and profane works. Your feats will be the joses, because you have walked one-eyed, having gone wrong, being beaten by a thousand captives and filthy filth. And if your pretty Dulcinea commits a mischief against you, not even to your troubles, does she show a good temper, in such an act of mischief? Your con ought be that Sancho Panza was a bad pimp, he was a fool, she is tough, and you are not a lover. Dialogue between B-A-B-I-E-C-A -E and R-O-C-I-N-A-N-T-E Sonnet B How are you, Racinant, so thin? Ah, because you never eat, and you work. B. Well, what about the barley and the straw? Ah my master does not leave me a bite. Be come on, sir. You are very badly brought up, because your ass's tongue outrages your master. Ah. Donkey is from the cradle to the shroud. Do you want to see it? Miranda in love B is it foolish to love? Ah it is not great prudence. B metaphysical you are. Ah it's just that I don't eat. B. Complain about the squire. A. It is not enough. 
How can I complain about my ailment, if the master and squire or steward are as nags as Racinant? I don't want to remember. Not long ago there lived a hidalgo of those with a lance in a shipyard. An old buckler, a skinny hack and a greyhound for runner. A pot of something more cow than mutton, salpicon most nights, jewels and brokenness on Saturdays, lantels on Fridays, some added pigeon on Sundays, consumed the three parts of his hacienda. The rest of her ended in a veiled tunic, fleece leggings for parties, with her slippers of the same, and on weekdays she honored herself with her finest fleece. He had in his house a mistress who was over forty, and a niece who was not quite twenty, and a farm boy who saddled the hack as he took the pruning shear. He was close to the age of our Hidalgo with fifty years, he was of a strong complexion, dry of flesh, gaunt of face, a great early riser and a lover of hunting. They mean that he had the nickname of Quijada, or Quesada, that in this there is some difference in the authors who write about this case, although, by credible conjectures, it is understood that his name was Quijana, but this matters little to our tale. It is enough that in his narration not a point of truth is left out. It is, then, to know that this nobleman, the moments that he was idle, which were the most of the year, he gave himself to read books of chivalry, with such fondness and pleasure, that he almost forgot the exercise of hunting, and even the administration of his estate. And he became so curious and foolish in this, that he sold many Hanegas of cultivated land to buy books of chivalry in which to read, and thus, he took to his house as many as there could be of them. And of all of them, none seemed as good to him as those composed by the famous Feliciano de Silva, because the clarity of his prose and those intricate reasons of his seemed to him pearly, and even more so when he came to read those compliments and letters of challenge, where in many parts it was written, the reason for the unreason that is done to my reason, in such a way my reason weakens, that with reason I complain of your beauty. And also when he read the high heavens that from your divinity divinely fortify you with the stars, and make you deserving of the merit that your greatness deserves. With these reasons the poor gentleman lost his senses, and kept awake trying to understand them and unravel their meaning, which Aristotle himself would not be able to extract or understand if he were resurrected for just that. He was not very well with the wounds that Don Belianus gave and received, because he imagined that, no matter how great teachers had healed him, he would not stop having his face and his whole body full of scars and marks. But, nevertheless, he praised his author for finishing his book with the promise of that endless adventure, and many times he wanted to take up his pen and finish it to the letter, as promised. There. And without a doubt he would do it, and even get away with it, if other greater and continuous thoughts did not hinder him. He often had competition with the priest of his place who was a learned man, graduated from Siguenza, over which had been the better gentleman, Parmarin de Ingalaterra or Amadis de Gaula, but Master Nicolas, the barber of the same town, said that no one came close to the knight of Phoebus, and that if anyone could be compared to him, it was Don Gala, brother of Amadis de Gaula, because he had a very comfortable condition for everything. That he was not a finicky gentleman, nor was he a crybaby like his brother, and that in terms of courage he was not behind him. In short, he became so engrossed in reading about it that he spent his nights reading from clear to clear, and the days from cloudy to cloudy, and so, from little sleep and much reading, his brain dried up so that he came to lose his wits. His fantasy was filled with everything he read about in books, as well as enchantments and quarrels, battles, challenges, wounds, compliments, 
love affairs, storms, and impossible nonsense, and it settled in his imagination in such a way that all that machine of those sounded dreamed inventions that he read was true, that for him there was no other truer story in the world. He used to say that the Sid Rai Diaz had been a very good knight, but that he had nothing to do with the knight of the burning sword, who with just one backhand had split two fierce and enormous giants in half. He was better with Bernardo del Carpio, because in Roncesvalles the enchanted Roldan had died, making use of the industry of Hercules, when he drowned Anteo, the son of the earth, in his arms. He said a lot of good things about the giant Morgant, because, despite being from that gigantic generation, where everyone is arrogant and intemperate, he was only affable and well-bred. But, above all, he was fine with Reynaldo's de Montalbán, and even more so when he saw him leave his castle and steal as many as he came across, and when in Allende he stole that idol of Muhammad. That was all gold, according to his story. He would give, to give a kicking hand to the traitor Galilon, to the mistress he had, and even to his niece in addition. In effect, now that his judgment was over, he came to realize the strangest thought that he had ever given to the madman in the world, and it was that it seemed convenient and necessary, both for the increase of his honor and for the service of his republic, to become a knight errant, and go all over the world with his weapons and horse to seek adventures and to exercise himself in all that he wanted. I had read that knights errant exercised, undoing all kinds of grievances, and putting themselves in situations and dangers where, finishing them, they would earn eternal name and fame. He imagined the poor man already crowned by the courage of his arm, at least, of the empire of Trabazond, and sir, with these pleasant thoughts, carried away by the strange pleasure that he felt in them. He hastened to put into effect what he desired. And the first thing he did was clean some weapons that had belonged to his great-grandparents, which, covered in rust and full of mold, had been sitting for centuries and forgotten in a corner. He cleaned and dressed him as best he could, but he saw that they had a great fault, and that was that they did not have a lace headpiece, but a simple morion, but to this he supplied his industry. Because of cardboard he made a half-helmet style, which, fitted with the morion, made the appearance of a whole helmet. It is true that to test whether he was strong and could risk a stab, he drew his sword and gave it two blows, and with the first and at one point he undid what he had done in a week, and he did not stop disapproving of the ease with which he had torn it to pieces, and, to be sure of this danger, he did it again putting some iron bars on the inside, in such a way that he was satisfied with the strength of him, and, without wanting to make a new experience of it, he called it a fine lace helmet. He then went to see his nag, and although it had more quarters than a real and more blemishes than Gonola's horse, that tantum pelis a ossa fuit, it seemed to him that neither Alexander's Bucephalus nor Elcid's Babieca were equal to him. Four days passed in imagining what name he would give it. Because, as he told himself, there was no reason that such a famous knight's horse, and one that was so good in itself, should have no known name. And thus, he tried to accommodate himself in such a way as to declare who he had been, before he became a knight errant, and what he was then for he was very right that, when the lady changed his status, he also changed his name, and made him famous and noisy, as was appropriate to the new order and the new exercise that he already professed. And sir, after many names that he formed, erased and removed, added, undoed and redid in his memory and imagination, he finally came to call him Racinant, a name, in his opinion, loud, sonorous and 
significant of what had he had been when he was a nag, before what he was now, which was before and first of all the nags in the world. Giving his horse a name, and to his liking, he wanted to give it himself, and with this thought he lasted another eight days, and at last he came to call himself Don Quixote, from where as has been. Said the authors of this true story took the opportunity, which, without a doubt, must have been called Quijada, and not Quesada, as others wanted to say. But, remembering that the valiant Amadis had not only been content with simply calling himself Amadis, but added the name of his kingdom and homeland, by famous Hepila, and was called Amadis de Gaula. Thus he wanted, like a good knight, to add to his the name of his and calling himself Don Quixote de la Mancha, with which, in his opinion, he declared his lineage and country very vividly, and honored her by taking her nickname, Clean. Then, his weapons, made of the helmet helmet, naming his nag and confirming himself, he gave himself to understand that he had nothing else to do but to find a lady with whom he would fall in love. Because the knight errant without love was a tree without leaves and without fruit and a body without a soul. He said to himself, If I, due to the evil of my sins, or by my good luck, find myself out there with some giant, as usually happens to knights errant, and I knock him down from an encounter, or I will kill him for half of the body, or, finally, I defeat him and surrender him, wouldn't it be nice to have someone to send him presented and come in and kneel before my sweet lady, and say with a humble and surrendered voice, I, lady, am the giant Caraculi Ambro, lord of the Melindrania island, whom he defeated in singular battle as never should be, praised knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, who ordered me to present myself before your grace, so that your greatness may dispose of me according to your wishes. Oh! How pleased our good gentleman was when he had made this speech, and more so. When he found someone to name his lady. And it was, it is believed, that in a place near his there was a very good-looking farm girl, with whom he was in love for a time, although, it is understood. She never knew it nor did she give him a taste of it. Her name was Aldonza Lorenzo, and it seemed appropriate to give her the title of mistress of her thoughts, and, looking for a name of hers that would not contradict hers too much, and that would pull her and lead her to hers as princess and great lady of hers, she came to call her Dulcinea del Toboso, because she was a native of Toboso, a name, in his opinion, musical and pilgrim and significant, like all the others that he had given to him and his things. Point two chapter which deals with the first departure from his land that the ingenious Don Quixote made he wanted to wait more time to put his thought into effect, squeezing to it the lack that he thought his tardiness caused in the world, according to the grievances that he intended to undo, wrongs to right, wrongs to amend, and abuses to improve and debts to pay, satisfy. And sir, without informing anyone of his intention, and without anyone seeing him, one morning, before daylight, which was one of the hottest days in the month of July, he armed himself with all his weapons, mounted Racinant, his ill-composed helmet, he clutched his shield, took his lance, and, through the false door of a corral, went out into the field with great contentment and exhilaration. At seeing how easily he had started his good wish. But, he hardly saw himself in the field, when he was assailed by a terrible thought, and such, that it almost made him give up the company begun, and it was that he remembered that he was not armed. As a knight, in that, according to the law of chivalry, he could not and should not take arms with any knight, and, since he was, he had to carry white weapons, like a novice knight, without a company on the shield, 
until he won it through his own effort. These thoughts made him hesitate in his purpose. But, his madness being more powerful than any other reason, he proposed to be knighted by the first one he met, in imitation of many others who did. So, according to what he had read in the books that considered him so. As for the bladed weapons, I was planning to clean them in such a way, if they took place, that they would be more than a stoat, and with this he calmed down and continued on his way, taking no other than the one that his horse wanted, believing that in that consisted the strength of adventures. As our brand new adventurer walked, then, he was talking to himself and saying, who doubts that in the coming times, when the true history of my famous deeds comes to light, that the wise man who writes them will not put, when he comes to how can I tell this my first departure so early in the morning, in this way, there was hardly the ruddy Apollo stretched out on the face of the wide and spacious earth the golden strands of his beautiful hair, and hardly the small and painted birds with their harpy tongues had greeted with sweet and mellifluous harmony the coming of the rosy dawn, which, leaving the soft bed of the jealous husband, showed itself to mortals through the doors and balconies of the La Mancha horizon, when the famous knight Don Quixote of La Mancha, leaving the idle feathers, climbed on his famous horse Racinant, and began to walk through the old and well-known field of Montiel. And it was the truth that he walked by. And he added saying, Blessed age, and blessed century that where my famous feats will come to light, worthy of being carved in bronze, sculpted in marble and painted on tablets for memory in the future. O oh you, enchanting sage, whoever you are, who has to be the chronicler of this strange story, I beg you not to forget my good Racinant, my eternal companion in all my ways and careers. Then he would come back saying, as if he were truly in love, O oh Princess Dulcinea, lady of this captive heart. You have done me a great deal of wrong in dismissing me and reproaching me with the rigorous determination of ordering me not to appear before your beauty. Pray, lady, to membraros of your subject heart, which suffers so many troubles for your love. With these he was threading other nonsense, all in the manner of those his books had taught him, imitating his language as much as he could. With this, he walked so slowly, and the sun came in so quickly and with such heat, that it was enough to melt his brains, if he had any. Almost all that day he walked without happening anything worth mentioning, of which he despaired, because he wanted to run into someone to experience the value of his strong arm. There are authors who say that the first adventure that suited him was that of Puerto Lopez. Others say that of the windmills, but, what I have been able to find out in this case, and what I have found written in the annals of La Mancha, is that he walked all that day, and, at nightfall, his horse and he found themselves tired and dead from hunger, and, looking everywhere to see if he would discover some castle or some shepherd's flock where he could retreat and where he could remedy his great hunger and need. He saw, not far from the road where he was going, an inn, which was as if he saw a star that, not to the portals, but to the Alcazes of his redemption he was directing. God hastened to walk, and he reached her in time for evening. There were perhaps two young women at the door, the kind they call from the party, who were going to Seville with some muleteers who happened to be making a journey that night at the inn and, as to our adventurer everything that he thought, saw or imagined seemed to be fact and pass into the mode of what he had read, after he saw the inn, he imagined that it was a castle with its four towers, and spears of shining silver, without missing its drawbridge and deep cellar, with all those adherents who paint such castles. He kept coming to the inn, which to him seemed like a castle, 
and a short distance from it he stopped Rosinant's reins, waiting for some dwarf to stand between the battlements to give a signal with a trumpet that a knight was arriving at the castle. But, as he saw that they were taking a long time and that Racinant was hurrying to get to the stable, he went to the door of the inn, and saw the two distracted girls who were there, who seemed to him to be two beautiful maidens or two graceful ladies who were enjoying themselves in front of the castle gate. At this point, it happened that a swineherd who was collecting from some stubble a herd of pigs which, without pardon, that's what they are called blew a horn, at which signal they collected themselves, and Don Quixote instantly realized what was happening. He wished, which was that some dwarf signaled his coming, and sir, with strange contentment, he arrived at the inn and the ladies, who, seeing a man of that sort coming, armed and with a spear and shield, full of fear, were going to enter the inn, but Don Quixote, sensing their fear of him from his flight, raising his paper visor and revealing his dry and dusty face, with a gentle manner and a calm voice, said to them, Don't flee, your graces, and don't fear any mischief. C.A. to the order of chivalry that I profess does not touch or concern anyone, especially so high maidens as your presence demonstrates. The girls looked at him, and they walked with their eyes searching his face, which the bad visor covered him. But, since they heard themselves called maidens, something so out of their profession. They could not keep up their laughter, and so Don Quixote came running and saying to them, Moderation seems good in beautiful women, and laughter is also very foolish. That it proceeds from a slight cause. But I'm not saying it because you're upset or in a bad mood. That mine is not the one to serve you. The misunderstood language of the ladies and the poor figure of our gentleman increased laughter in them and anger in him, and he would have passed far ahead if the innkeeper had not come out at that point, a man who, being very fat, was very peaceful, who, seeing that misshapen figure, armed with weapons as unequal as the bridle, lance, buckler, and corslet, did not he was useless in accompanying the maidens in showing their contentment. But, in fact, fearing the machine with so many equipment, he determined to speak to it politely, and sir, he said to him, if your grace, gentlemen, looks for an inn, apart from the bed, because there are none in this inn, everything else will be found in great abundance. Don Quixote, seeing the humility of the governor of the fortress, who seemed to him like the innkeeper and the inn, answered, for me, Castilian lord, anything is enough, because my trappings are weapons, my rest is fighting, etc. The guest thought that calling him a Castilian had been because he seemed to be one of the healthy people of Castile, although he was Andalusian, and one of those from the San Luca beach, no less a thief than Caco, no less a thug than a student page, and thus, he replied, according to that, your grace's beds will be hard rocks, and your sleep will always be awake, and being so, it is possible to get out, with the certainty of finding in this hut occasion and occasions not to sleep in a whole year, much less in one night. And, saying this, he went to hold the stirrup for Don Quixote, who dismounted with great difficulty and labor, like someone who had not had breakfast all day. He then told the guest to take great care of his horse, because it was the best piece that ate bread in the world. The innkeeper looked at him, and he did not seem to him as good as Don Quixote said, not even half, and, making him comfortable in the stable, he saw again what his guest was sending, who was being disarmed by the maidens, who had already reconciled with him, which, although they had removed his breastplate and back, 
never knew how to dislodge his ruff or remove his misshapen helmet, which he wore tied with green ribbons, and it was necessary to cut them, so as not to be able to remove the knots, but he did not want to consent in any way, and so he stayed all night with his helmet on, which was the most graceful and strange figure that he could think of, and, disarming him, as he imagined that those who were disarming him were some of the principal ladies and ladies of that castle, he said to them with great grace, Never was a gentleman of ladies so well served as Don Quixote was when he left his village. Wine. Maidens cured him. Princesses, his Racino, or Racinant. For this is the name, ladies and gentlemen, of my horse, and Don Quixote de la Mancha of mine, that, since I did not want to reveal myself until the deeds of your service and pro discovered me, the force of adapting this old romance of Lanzarote to the present purpose has caused you to know my name before all seasons, but the time will come when your lordships command me and I obey, and the courage of my arm discovers the desire I have to serve you. The girls, who were not accustomed to hearing such rhetoric, did not answer a word, they only asked him if he wanted to eat something. I would choose anyone, replied Don Quixote, because, from what I understand, it would be very relevant to me. Luckily, it happened to be Friday that day, and there was nothing in the entire sale. Except a few portions of a fish that in Castile is called haddock, and in Andalusia cod, and in other parts curadillo, and in other trout. They asked him if by chance his grace would eat trout, since there was no other fish to feed him. As there are many trout, replied Don Quixote, they can serve as one trout, because that's what I'm comfortable with being given eight reels in singles than in a piece of eight. What's more, it could be that these trout were like calves, which are better than cows, and kid than bastard. But, Whatever it is, come later, that the work and weight of the weapons cannot be carried out without the government of the guts. They set the table for him at the door of the inn, for the cool air, and the guest brought him a portion of the poorly soaked and worse cooked cod, and bread as black and filthy as his weapons, but it was a matter of great laughter to see him eat, because, as he had his helmet on and his visor up, he could not put anything in his mouth with his hands if another did not give it to him and put it on. And thus, one of those ladies served in this need. But, when giving him drink, it was not possible, nor would it be if the innkeeper did not pierce a reed, and putting one end in his mouth, he poured the wine through the other, and all this he received patiently in exchange for not breaking the ribbons of the helmet. While doing this, perhaps a pig castrator came up for sale, and as soon as he arrived, he blew his reed whistle four or five times, whereupon Don Quixote finished confirming that he was in some famous castle, and that they served him with music, and that the haddock were trout, the bread, candle, and the harlots, ladies, and the innkeeper, Castellan of the castle, and with this he considered his determination and departure well spent. But what tired him most was not seeing himself armed as a knight, because it seemed to him that he could not legitimately embark on any adventure without receiving the order of knighthood. From this thought, he shortened his ventilous and limited dinner, which finished, he called the innkeeper, and, Locking himself in the stable with him, he knelt before him, saying, I will never get up from where I am, valiant knight, until your courtesy grants me a gift that I want to ask of you, which will redound in your praise and in favor of the human race. The innkeeper, who saw his guest at his feet and heard such arguments, was confused looking at him, not knowing what to do or say to him and insisted on him getting up, and he never wanted to. 
until he had to tell him that he was granting him the gift that he asked for. I expected no less from your great magnificence, my lord, replied Don Quixote, and sir, I tell you that the gift that I have asked of you, and of your liberality has been granted to me, is that. Tomorrow on that day you will make me a knight, and tonight in the chapel of your castle I will watch over the arms, and tomorrow, as I have said, what I so desire will be fulfilled, to be able, as it should be, to go to all four parts of the world looking for adventures, in favor of the needy, as is in charge of the cavalry and the knights and antes, as I am, whose desire to such feats is inclined. The innkeeper, who, as has been said, was a little witty and already had some inklings of his guest's lack of judgment, finished believing it when he finished hearing such arguments from him, and in order to have something to laugh about that night, he determined to follow his lead. Humor. And sir, he told him that he was very successful in what he desired and requested, and that such a proposal was proper and natural to gentlemen as important as he seemed and as his gallant presence showed, and that he, likewise, in the years of his youth, had given himself to that honorable exercise, walking around various parts of the world looking for his adventures, without having left the Percales of Malaga, the Riron Islands, the Compass of Seville, and the Azorguejo of Segovia. La Olivera de Valencia, Rondilla de Granada, Playa de San Luca, Potro de Cordoba and Las Ventilas de Toledo and other diverse places, where he had exercised the lightness of his feet, subtlety of his hands, making many one-eyed wrongs, resting many widows, undoing some maidens and deceiving some pupils, and, finally, making himself known by how many hearings and courts there are in almost all of Spain, and that, ultimately, he had come to gather in that his castle, where he lived with his property and with those of others, collecting in it all the knights errant, of whatever quality and condition they were, just because of the great fans they had. He had them and for them to part with him from his assets, in payment of his good wish. He also told him that in his castle there was no chapel where he could watch over the weapons, because it had been demolished to rebuild it, but that, in case of need, he knew that they could keep vigil anywhere, and that that night he could keep vigil for them in a courtyard of the castle, that in the morning, God being served, the due ceremonies would be performed, so that he would be armed as a knight, and such a knight that he could no longer be in the world. He asked him if he brought money. Don Quixote replied that he did not bring Blanca, because he had never read in the histories of knights errant that no one had brought them. To this the innkeeper said that he was deceiving himself, that, since it was not written in the stories, because it seemed to the authors of them that it was not necessary to write something as clear and as necessary to bring as money and clean shirts, it was not for that reason to believe that they were not written. They brought, and thus, it should be taken for certain and ascertained that all the knights errant, with which so many books are full and crowded, carried their bags well ironed, for whatever might happen to them, and that they also carried shirts and a small chest full of ointments to cure the wounds they received, because not always in the fields and deserts where they fought and were wounded. There was someone who healed them, unless they already had some enchanting wise man for a friend, who then helped them, bringing through the air, in some cloud, some maiden or dwarf with some vial of water of such virtue that, in tasting a drop of it, immediately they were healed of their sores and wounds, as if some disease they would have had but, as long as this did not happen, the past knights considered it right that their squires were provided with money and other necessary things, such as lint and ointments to heal, and, 
when it happened that such knights did not have squires, which were few and rare, they themselves carried everything in very thin saddlebags, which hardly resembled the horse's haunches, as if it was something else of more importance. Because, not being for such an occasion, this carrying of saddlebags was not widely accepted among knights errant, and for this reason he gave him advice, since he could still command him as his Bodson, who would be so soon, not to walk from then on without money and without the aforementioned precautions, and that he would see how well he was with them when least expected. Don Quixote promised to do as he was advised with all punctuality, and sir, an order was immediately given to guard the weapons in a large corral that was to one side of the inn, and Don Quixote, collecting them all, placed them on a basin that was next to a well, and, clutching his buckler, he seized his lance and with a gentle manner began to walk in front of the basin, and when he began the walk he was beginning to close the night, the innkeeper told everyone who was in the inn about the madness of his guest, the candle of weapons and the cavalry armor that he expected. They were astonished at such a strange kind of madness and went to look at him from afar, and saw that, with a serene gesture, he sometimes walked around, other times, leaning against his spear, he would put his eyes on the weapons, without taking them away from them for a good distance. He finished closing the night, but with such moonlight that he could compete with the one who gave it to him, so that whatever the novice gentleman did he was well seen by all. At this point, one of the muleteers who were in the inn took the fancy of going to give water to his pack, and it was necessary to remove Don Quixote's weapons, which were on the basin, who, seeing him coming, said to him in a loud voice, O oh you, whoever you are, daring knight, who manages to touch the weapons of the most valiant errant who ever girded himself with a sword. Look what you do. And do not touch them, if you do not want to leave life in payment of your daring. The muleteer was not cured of these reasons, and it would be better if he were cured, because it would be cured in health, before, locking the straps, he threw them a long way from himself. Seeing which Don Quixote raised his eyes to heaven, and, fixing his thoughts it seemed on his lady Dulcinea, he said, Help me, my lady, in this first affront that is offered to this your subdued breast. Let your favor and protection not fail me in this first trance. And, saying these and other similar reasons, dropping the buckler, he raised the two-handed lance and struck the muleteer so hard on the head with it that he felled him to the ground. So battered that, if he seconded with another, he would not need a teacher to heal him. This done, he picked up his weapons and returned to walk with the same calm as before. From there shortly, without knowing what had happened, because the muleteer was still stunned, Another arrived with the same intention of giving water to his mules, and, coming to take away the weapons to clear the pile, without speaking a word and without asking anyone's favor, Don Quixote dropped the buckler again and raised the lance again, and without breaking it into pieces, he struck the second head of the second into more than three pieces. Muleteer, because it was opened by four. All the people from the inn came to the noise, including the innkeeper. Seeing this, Don Quixote seized his shield, and putting his hand on his sword, said, O oh lady of the beauty, effort and vigor of my weakened heart. Now it is time that you turn the eyes of your greatness to this your captive gentleman, who is attending such an adventure. With this, in his opinion, he gained such courage that if all the muleteers in the world attacked him, he would not turn back. The companions of the wounded, when they saw them, began to rain stones on Don Quixote from a distance, who, as best he could, repaired himself with his shield, and did not dare move away from the 
advanced so as not to abandon his weapons. The innkeeper called out for them to leave him, because he had already told them how crazy he was, and that because he was crazy he would get away, even if he killed them all. Don Quixote also gave them more, calling them treacherous and treacherous, and that the lord of the castle was a troublemaker and a bad-born knight, since he consented to the intercourse of knights errant in such a way, and that if he had received the order of chivalry, that he would make him understand his treachery, but I pay no attention to you, filthy and base scoundrel. Shoot. Come. Come and offend me as much as you can, and you will see the payment that you carry of your foolishness and excess. He said this with such verve and boldness, that he instilled a terrible fear in those who attacked him, and, as well for this as for the persuasions of the innkeeper, they stopped shooting him, and he let the wounded withdraw and return to the sale of his guns with the same stillness and calm as before. The innkeeper did not like the mockery of his guest, and he determined to cut short and give her the black order of chivalry soon, before another misfortune happened. And sir, approaching him, he apologized for the insolence that those low people had used with him, without his knowing anything, but how well punished they were for his audacity. He told her as he had already told her that there was no chapel in that castle and for what remained to be done it was not necessary either, that the whole touch of being knighted consisted of the slap and the accolade, according to what he had heard about the ceremonial of the order, and that this could be done in the middle of a field, and that he had already fulfilled what he had to do when keeping watch of arms, that with only two hours of vigil it was fulfilled, the more, that he had been more than four. Don Quixote believed everything, and he said that he was there soon to obey him, and that he should conclude as soon as he could, because if he were attacked again and saw himself armed as a knight, he did not intend to leave a living person in the castle, except those that he sent him, whom he would leave out of respect for him. Warned and fearful of this, the castellan immediately brought a book where he entered the straw and barley that he gave to the muleteers, and with a candle end that a boy brought him, and with the two maidens already mentioned, he went to where Don Quixote was, whom he ordered to kneel, and, reading in his manual, as if he were saying some devout prayer, in the middle of the legend he raised his hand and gave him a good blow on the neck, and behind him, with his same sword, a gentle back, always muttering between his teeth, like he was praying this done, he ordered one of those ladies to gird his sword on him, which she did with great ease and discretion, because not a little was needed to avoid bursting with laughter at each point of the ceremonies, but the feats they had already seen of the novice knight had them laughing at bay. Giving him the sword, the good lady said, God make your grace a very lucky knight and give him luck in battles. Don Quixote asked him what his name was, so that he would know from then on to whom. He was bound by the favor received, because he intended to give her some part of the honor that was achieved by the value of his arm. She answered with great humility that her name was Toloza and that she was the daughter of a cobbler from Toledo who lived next to Sancho Bianaya's shops, and that wherever she was she would serve him and have him as her master. Don Quixote replied that, for the love of her, he would do her a favor that from then on he would be her Don and she would be called Dona Toloza. She promised him, and the other put the spur on him with which almost the same colloquy happened to her as with the one with the sword, he asked her name, and she said that her name was La Molinera, and that she was the daughter of an honest miller from Antiquera, to which she also begged Don Quixote to put herself as her don and call herself Dona Molinera, offering her new services and favors. The ceremonies hitherto never seen before were done at a gallop and haste, 
and Don Quixote couldn't wait to see himself on horseback and set out in search of adventures, and, immediately saddling Racinant, she climbed into it, and embracing her guest, she said such strange things to him, thanking him for having made him a knight, that it is impossible to relate them. The innkeeper, seeing him already out of the inn, responded to his with no less rhetoric, although with shorter words, and, without asking him for the cost of the inn, let him go at the right time. Point four. Chapter of what it happened to our knight when he left the inn. The dawn would be when Don Quixote left the inn, so happy, so gallant, so overjoyed at seeing himself already armed as a knight, that joy burst through the horse's girths. But, coming to mind the advice of his guest about the precautions so necessary that he had to take with him, especially that of money and shirts, he determined to return home and accommodate himself to everything, and a squire, pretending to receive a neighboring farmer of his, who was poor and had children, but very suitable for the cavalry squire trade. With this thought he guided Racine on towards his village, which, almost knowing his fondness, began to walk so eagerly that it seemed that he did not put his feet on the ground. He hadn't gone far, when it seemed to him that at his right hand, from the thickness of a forest that was there, some delicate voices came out, like someone complaining, and hardly had he heard them, when he said, I give thanks to heaven for the favor it has shown me, for it has so quickly set before me occasions where I can fulfill what I owe to my profession, and where I can gather the fruit of my good wishes. Dot. These voices, without a doubt, are from some needy man or woman, who needs my favor and help. And, turning the reins, he directed Racinant toward where he thought the voices came from. And, a few steps after he entered through the woods, he saw a mare tied to an oak tree, and tied to another a boy, naked from the middle up, up to the age of fifteen, who was the one who was giving the voices, and not without reason, because he was giving a well-built farmer many lashes with a waistband, and each lash accompanied him with a rebuke and advice. Because he used to say, the tongue remains and the eyes ready. And the boy answered, I will not do it again, my lord, by the passion of God, that I will not do it again, and I promise to be more careful with the herd from now on. And when Don Quixote saw what was happening, he said in an angry voice, Impolite knight, it seems bad to take you with whom one cannot defend. Get on your horse and take your lance which also had a lance leaning against the top where the mare was least, and I will make you know that what you are doing is cowardly. The farmer, who saw above him that figure full of weapons brandishing the spear over his face, considered himself dead, and with good words replied, Sir Knight, this boy that I am punishing is one of my servants, who serves me to guard a herd of sheep that I have in these surroundings, which is so neglected that one is missing every day, and, because he punished his negligence, or knavery, he says that I am miserable, for not paying him the salary that I owe him, and in God and in my soul he lies. Are you lying, in front of me, you wicked villain? said Don Quixote. By the sun that shines on us, I'm about to pass you from part to part with this spear. Pay him later without further reply. If not, by the God who governs us, may he conclude and annihilate you on this point. Untie him later. The farmer lowered his head and, without answering a word, untied his servant, to whom Don Quixote asked how much his mistress owed him. He said that nine months, at seven reais each month. He did the math, Don Quixote, and found that it amounted to seventy-three reals, and he told the farmer to pay it out right away, if he didn't want to die for it. 
The fearful villain replied that for the pace he was in and the oath he had sworn, and he had not yet sworn anything, that there were not that many, because they had to deduct and receive into account three pairs of shoes that he had given him and are of two bleedings that had been made while he was ill. All that is well, replied Don Quixote, but keep the shoes and the bleeding from the lashes you gave him without fault, that if he tore the leather of the shoes that you paid for, you have torn the leather of his body, and if the barber took blood from him when he was sick, you have taken it from him in health, so, for this part, he owes you nothing. The problem is, sir gentleman, that I don't have any money here, and dress come with me to my house, and I'll pay you one real over another. I go with him, said the boy. But, bad year, no, sir, not even for food, because, seeing himself alone, he skins me like a Saint Bartholomew. He won't do that, replied Don Quixote, it's enough for me to order it for him to respect me and as long as he swears it to me by the law of chivalry that he has received, I will let him go free and secure the pay. Look at what your grace says, sir, said the boy, that this master of mine is not a knight nor has he received any order of chivalry, that is Juan Haldudo the rich, the neighbor of the Quintana. That matters little, replied Don Quixote, for there may be knights in Haldudo's, the more, that each one is the son of his works. That's true, said Andres, but this my master, of what works is he the son, since he denies me my salary and my sweat and work? I don't deny it, brother Andres, answered the farmer, and give me the pleasure of coming with me, for I swear by all the orders of chivalry in the world to pay you, as I have said, one reel over another, and even incense. I am pleased with the incense, said Don Quixote. Give them in reels, that's what I'm content with, and see that you fulfill it as you have sworn. If not, by the same oath I swear to return to look for you and to punish you, and that I have to find you, even if you hide more than a lizard. And if you want to know who commanded you this, to be more truly obliged to fulfill it, know that I am the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha, the undoer of grievances and injustices, and to God. Remain, and do not depart from your minds what was promised and sworn, under pain of the sentence pronounced. And, saying this, he stung the Racinant from him, and in a short space she withdrew from him. The farmer followed him with his eyes, and when he saw that he had cleared the woods and that he no longer appeared, he turned to his servant Andres and said to him, Come here, my son, I want to pay you what I owe you, like that undoer of grievances he left me commanded. That I swear, said Andres, and how could your grace be successful in fulfilling the commandment of that good gentleman, that he live a thousand years? Roque lives. According to him, he is brave. And a good judge, and if he doesn't pay me, let him come back and carry out what he said. I swear it too, said the farmer. But, because of how much I love you, I want to increase the debt to increase the pay. And, seizing him by the arm, he tied him up again to the oak, where he gave him so many lashes that he left him for dead. Call. Mr. Andres, now, said the farmer, to the writer of grievances, you'll see how he doesn't write this one, although I believe that he has not finished doing it, because I want to skin you alive, as you feared. But, at last, he untied him and gave him permission to go find his judge, so that she could carry out the pronounced sentence. Andres broke off somewhat sulkily, swearing to go find the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha and tell him point by point what had happened, and that he had to pay him with the seventies. But, with all this, 
He left crying and his master was left laughing. And in this way the valorous Don Quixote undid the offense. Who, very pleased with what had happened, seeming to him that he had given a very happy and lofty beginning to his chivalries, with great self-satisfaction was walking towards his village, saying in a low voice, Well you can call yourself happy over all those who live on earth today. Oh above the beautiful beautiful Dulcinea del Toboso. Because it was your lot to have subject and surrendered to all your will and will as so brave and so named knight as Don Quixote de la Mancha is and will be, who, as everyone knows, yesterday he received the order of chivalry, and today he has undone the greatest wrongdoing and wrong that caused unreason and cruelty. Today he took the whip from the hand of that ruthless enemy who so without occasion beat that delicate infant. In this, he came to a road that divided into four, and then he imagined the crossroads where the knights errant began to think which path they would take, and, to imitate them, he remained quiet for a while, and, after having thought about it very well, he released the rein to Racinant, leaving his will to the nag, which followed his first attempt, which was to go towards his stable. And, having travelled about two miles, Don Quixote discovered a large crowd of people who, as it was later learned, were merchants from Toledo who were going to buy silk in Mercia. There were six of them, and they came with their parasols, with four other servants on horseback and three mule boys on foot. As soon as Don Quixote saw them, he imagined that they were something of a new adventure, and, in order to imitate as far as he thought possible the steps that he had read about in his books, it seemed to him that one that he intended to do came from the mold. And sir, with gentle contempt and courage, he firmly established himself in his stirrups, grasped the lance, reached the buckler to his chest, and, positioned in the middle of the road, waited for those knights errant to arrive, for he already considered them such, and judged, and, when they had come within a distance of where they could see and hear each other, Don Quixote raised his voice, and with an arrogant gesture said, everyone has it, if everyone doesn't confess that there isn't every maiden in the world more beautiful than the Empress of La Mancha, the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso. The merchants stopped to the sound of these words, and to see the strange figure of the one who said them. And, by the figure and by the reasons, soon they began to see the madness of the owner of him. But they wanted to see slowly what the confession that was requested of them was about, and one of them, who was a little mocking and very much discreet, told him, Sir Knight, we don't know who that good lady you say is. Show her to us. If she were as beautiful as you suggest, we will willingly and without any urgency confess the truth that is requested of us on your part. If she were to show it to you, replied Don Quixote, what would you do to confess such a notorious truth? The importance is that without seeing it you have to believe, confess, affirm, swear and defend. Where not? With me you are in battle, huge and arrogant people. That, now you come one by one, as requested by the order of chivalry, pray all together, as is the custom and misuse of your ilk, here I await and wait for you, confident in the reason that I have. On my part. Sir Knight, replied the merchant, I beg your grace, in the name of all these princes who are here, that we not burden our consciences by confessing something never seen or heard by us, and even more so being so detrimental to the empresses and queens of Alcaria and Estremadura. May your grace show us a portrait of that lady, even if it is the size of a grain of wheat, that the ball will be pulled out by the thread, and we will be satisfied and secure with this, and your grace will be satisfied and paid. 
And I even believe that we are already so on her side that, although her portrait shows us that she is one-eyed and that vermilion and sulfur stone flow from the other, with all that, to please your grace, we will say everything in her favor. What would you like, no, you infamous scoundrel, answered Don Quixote, inflamed with rage. It does not flow, I say, what you say, but amber and civet between cotton, and she is not one-eyed or hunched over, but straighter than a Guadarrama spindle. But you will pay for the great blasphemy that you have spoken against such a beauty as my lady. And, saying this, he attacked the man who had said it, with his spear lowered, with such fury and anger that, if good luck did not cause Racinon to trip and fall in the middle of the road, the daring merchant would have a hard time. Racinon fell, and his master rolled a good piece across the field, and, wanting to get up, he never could. Such an embarrassment caused him by the spear, buckler, spurs and helmet, with the weight of the ancient weapons. And while he was struggling to get up and couldn't, he was saying, don't run away, you cowardly people, captive people, pay attention, that it is not my fault, but my horses, that I am lying here. One of the mule boys who came there, who must not have been very well intentioned, hearing the poor fallen man say so many arrogant words, could not bear it without giving him the answer in the ribs. And, going up to him, he took the lance, and after having smashed it into pieces, with one of them he began to give our Don Quixote so many blows that, despite and despite his weapons, he ground him. Like a cyber. His masters yelled at him not to give him so much and to leave him alone, but he was already pissed off by the young man and he did not want to leave the game until he envied all the rest of his anger. And, going for the rest of the pieces of the lance, he finished undoing them on the miserable fallen man, who, with all that storm of sticks that he saw on him, did not shut his mouth. Threatening heaven and earth, and the thugs, who so they seemed to him. The young man got tired, and the merchants continued on their way, taking what to tell about the poor beaten man, who, after finding himself alone, returned to test if he could get up, but if he couldn't make it when whole and good, how could he make it ground up and almost undone? And he still considered himself lucky. It seemed to him that this was the misfortune of knights errant, and he attributed it all to the lack of his horse, and it was not possible to get up, as his whole body was bruised. Point five. Chapter where the narration of the Argentleman's misfortune seeing, then, that, in effect, he could not move, he agreed to avail himself of his ordinary remedy, which was to think of some passage. In his books, and his madness brought to his memory that of Valdovinos and the Marquis of Mantova, when Carlo To left him wounded on the mountain, a story known to children, not unknown to young men. Celebrated and even believed by the old, and, with all this, no truer than the miracles of Muhammad. This, then, seemed to him that it came from the mould for the step in which he found himself, and sir, with signs of great feeling, he began to roll over on the ground and say with weakened breath the same thing that the wounded knight of the forest said, Where are you, my lady, that my illness does not hurt you? Either you don't know, ma'am, or you are false and disloyal. And, in this way, the romance continued until those verses that say, O oh, noble Marquis of Mantova, my uncle and carnal lord. And as luck would have it, when he arrived at this verse, a farmer from the same place and his neighbor happened to pass by, who had come from taking a load of wheat to the mill, who, seeing that man lying there, went up to him and asked him who he was and how bad he felt that he was complaining so sadly. Don Quixote doubtless believed that this was the Marquis of Mantova, 
his uncle, and sir, he did not answer anything other than to continue in his romance, where he told her of his misfortune and of the love of the son of the emperor with his wife, all in the same way that the romance sings it. The farmer was amazed hearing that nonsense, and, taking off her visor, which was already in pieces from the sticks, he wiped her face, which was covered with dust, and he had barely cleaned him up. When he met him and said, Sonor Quijana, as he must have been called when he was in court and hadn't gone from calm Hidalgo to knight errant, who has placed at your mercy this fate? Question mark. But he continued with his romance to what he asked. Seeing this, the good man, as best he could, removed his breastplate and back, to see if he had any wounds, but he saw neither blood nor any sign. He tried to lift him off the ground, and with no little effort he mounted him on his donkey, for appearing more sedate cavalry. He gathered up the weapons, even the splinters of the lance, and wrapped them around Racinant, taking him by the rein and the donkey by the halter, and headed toward his town, deep in thought to hear the nonsense that Don Quixote was saying. And Don Quixote was no less for he could not hold himself on the donkey because he was bruised and broken, and from time to time he gave a few sighs that he put into heaven, so that he again forced the farmer to ask him to tell him how bad he felt, and it only seems that the devil brought to his memory the tales adapted to his events, because, at that point, forgetting Valdovinos, he remembered the Morabinde, when the mayor of Antiquera, Rodrigo de Navarre, seized him and took him captive to his mayor's office so that, when the farmer asked him again how he was and what he was feeling, he responded with the same words and reasons that the captive Abenqueraje responded to Rodrigo de Navarre, in the same way that he had read the story in La Diana, by Jorge from Montemayor, where it is written, taking advantage of it so deliberately, that the farmer was giving himself to the devil. From hearing so much nonsense machine, through which he learned that his neighbor was crazy, and he hurried her to the town, to excuse the anger that Don Quixote caused him with his long harangue. At the end of which, he said, Your Grace, Mr. Rodrigo de Navarre, Know that this beautiful Jarifa that I have mentioned is now the beautiful Dulcinea del Toboso, for whom I have done, de and will do the most famous deeds of chivalry that have been seen, see or will see in the world. To this the farmer replied, Look, your grace, sir, I am a sinner, I am not Don Rodrigo de Navarre, nor the Marquis of Mantova, but Pedro Alonso, his neighbor. Your grace is neither Valdovinos nor Abindere, but rather the honorable Hidalgo of Mr. Quijana. I know who I am, replied Don Quixote, and I know that I can be not only those that I have mentioned, but all the twelve peers of France, and even all the nine of fame, since all the feats that they all together and each one by themselves did, mine will be surpassed. In these talks and in other similar ones, they arrived at the place at nightfall, but the farmer waited until it was a little later night, so they wouldn't see the beaten Hidalgo as a bad gentleman. When, then, the hour seemed to him, he entered the town and Don Quixote's house, which he found in an uproar, and there were the priest and the local barber, who were great friends of Don Quixote, who was shouting to them by his mistress, what do you think, Senor Licenciado Pero Perez? That was the name of the priest, of my lord's misfortune. Three days ago he did not appear, nor the nag, nor the buckler, nor the lance, nor the weapons. Unfortunate me, I give myself to understand, and this is the truth as I was born to die, that these accursed books of chivalry that he has and usually reads so regularly have returned his wits, I now remember having heard him say many times, 
talking among themselves, that he wanted to become a knight errant and go looking for adventures in those worlds. Commend such books to Satan and Barabbas, which have thus spoiled the most delicate understanding that existed in all of La Mancha. The niece said the same thing, and even more. No. Master Nicolash that this was the name of the barber, that many times it happened to my lord uncle to spend two days and nights reading in these heartless books of misadventures, at the end of which, he threw the book from his hands, and put his hand to the sword and walked with knives with the walls, and when he was very tired, he said that he had killed four giants like four towers, and the sweat that he sweated from exhaustion said that it was blood from the wounds that he had received in battle, and he would then drink a large jug of cold water, and he would remain healthy and calm, saying that this water was a most precious drink that the wise Esquifer, a great enchanter and friend of his, had brought him. But I am to blame for everything, that I did not notify your graces of my uncle's nonsense, so that they would remedy it before reaching what has come to pass, and burn all these discommunicated books, which he has many, which are well worth be burned, as if they were heretics. This is what I say too, said the priest, and hope that tomorrow does not pass without their being held in public and condemned to fire, because they do not give anyone who reads them the opportunity to do what my good friend must have done. The farmer and Don Quixote were listening to all this, with which the farmer finished understanding the illness of his neighbor, and so he began to say loudly, Open your graces to Mr. Valdovinos and to the Marquis of Mantova, who has come badly wounded, and to the Moorish Lord Abinde, who is bringing captive the valiant Rodrigo de Navarre, mayor of Antiquera. At these voices, they all came out, and as some knew his friend, the others his master and uncle, who had not yet dismounted from the donkey because he could not, they ran to embrace him. He said, Hold on everyone, I've been badly injured because of my horse. Take me to my bed and call, if possible, the wise Ergander, to heal and treat my wounds. Look, it's time for a hammer, said the mistress at this point, if my heart told me right about the foot that my lord was limping. Your grace come up in good time, for without that hergada coming, we will know how to cure you here. Cursed, I say, be these books of chivalry once again and a hundred more, how have they ended up at your mercy? They then took him to bed, and, examining his wounds, found none, and he said that it was all grinding, for having taken a great fall with Racinant, his horse, fighting with ten Jayans, the most outrageous and daring that could fail in much of the land. Yeah, said the priest. Are Jayans in the dance? For my cross, that I burn him tomorrow before nightfall. They asked Don Quixote a thousand questions, and none of them wanted to answer anything other than that they give him something to eat and let him sleep, which was what mattered most to him. This was done, and the priest informed the farmer at length of the manner in which he had found Don Quixote. He told her everything, including the nonsense that he had said when he found him and when he brought him back which was making the licenciado more eager to do what he did the other day, which was to call his friend, the barber, Master Nicolash, with whom he came to Don Quixote's house. Barber they did in the bookstore of our ingenious Hidalgo who was still sleeping. He asked his niece for the keys to the room where the books were, the authors of the damage, and she gave them to him very willingly. They all went inside it, and the mistress with them, and they found more than a hundred bodies of large books, very well bound, and other small ones, and, as soon as the housekeeper saw them, she left the room again with great haste, and returned immediately with a bowl of holy water and a hyssop, and said, 
Take it, your grace, senor licenciado. Sprinkle this room. Don't be here any. Enchanting of the many who have these books, and we love them, to the pity of those that we want to give them by throwing them out of the world. The mistress's simplicity made the lawyer laugh, and he ordered the barber to give him those books one by one, to see what they were about, since he might find some that did not deserve punishment. By fire. No. Said the niece, there is no reason to forgive anyone. Because they have all been the offenders, it would be better to throw them out of the windows into the patio, and make a pile of them and set them on fire, and if not, take them to the corral, and there the bonfire will be made, and the smoke will not offend. The mistress said the same thing. Such was the desire that the two had for the death of those innocents. But the priest did not come to it without first even reading the titles. And the first that Master Nicolash gave him in his hands was the four of Amadis de Gaula, and the priest said, This seems to be something of a mystery, because, according to what I have heard, this book was the first of chivalry to be printed in Spain, and all the others have taken their beginning and origin from it. And sir, It seems to me that, as a dogmatizer of such an evil sect, we must, without any excuse, condemn fire. No, sir, said the barber, which I have also heard say is the best of all books. That of this genre have been composed, and thus, as unique in his art, he must be forgiven. That is true, said the priest. And for that reason, life is granted him for now. Let's see that other one next to him. He is, said the barber, the Sergis de Esplandian, legitimate son of Amadis de Gaula. Well, really, said the priest, the kindness of his father will not count for the son. Here, lady, mistress, open that window and throw him into the corral. And start the pile of the bonfire that has to be made. The mistress did so happily, and good old Esplandian flew to the corral, patiently waiting for the fire that threatened him. Go ahead, said the priest. This one who is coming, said the barber, is Amadis from Greece, and even all of those on this side, to what I believe, are of the same lineage as Amadis. Well, Everyone go to the corral, said the priest. That, in exchange for burning Queen Pintiquiniestra, and the shepherd Darinel, and their eclogues, and the devilish and scrambled words of their author, I will burn with them the father who fathered me, if he walked in the figure of a knight errant. I am of that opinion, said the barber. And even I, added the niece. Well, That's right, said the mistress, come, and to the corral with them. They gave them to her, and they were many, and she saved the ladder and gave them down through the window. Who is that barrel? said the priest. This is, replied the barber, Don Olivanti de Laura. The author of that book, said the priest, was the same one who composed Garden of Flowers, And it is true that he does not know how to determine which of the two books is more true, or, to put it better, less false. I only know how to say that this one will go to the corral for being crazy and arrogant. The next one is Florimort de Hercania, said the barber. Is there Mr. Florimort? replied the priest. Well, in faith, he has to stop quickly in the corral. Despite his strange birth and his high profile adventures, that the hardness and dryness of his style does not give rise to anything else. To the corral with him and that other, mistress, mistress. That pleases me, sir, she would reply, and with great joy she executed what was commanded. This is El Caballero Plata, said the barber. This is an ancient book, said the priest. And I find nothing in it that deserves approval. Accompany others without reply.
And so it was done. Another book was opened and they saw that it had the title The Knight of the Cross. For such a holy name as this book has, ignorance of it could be forgiven. But it is also customary to say, Behind the cross is the devil, go to the fire taking the barber another book, he said. This is mirror of chivalries. I already know his mercy, said the priest. There is Mr. Reynaldo's de Montalbán with his friends and companions, more thieves than Caco, and the twelve peers, with the true historian Terpene. And in truth I am about to condemn them to no more than perpetual banishment, if only because they have part of the invention of the famous Matteo Boyardo, from which the Christian poet Ludovico Ariosto also wove his cloth, to whom, if I find him here, and that he speaks in another language than his, I will have no respect for him. But if he speaks in his language, I will put him on my head. Well, I have him in Italian, said the barber, but I don't understand him. It wouldn't even be good for you to understand him, replied the priest, and here we would forgive the captain for not having brought him to Spain and made him a Castilian. That took away much of its natural value, and the same will be done by all those who want to turn verse books into another language, that, no matter how much care they take and skill they show, they will never reach the point that they have in their first birth. I say, in effect, that this book, and all those that have found that deal with these things in France, lie down and deposit themselves in a dry well until it is seen with more agreement what has to be done about them, effectuating a Bernardo del Carpio who is around and another named Roncesvalles, that these, upon reaching my hands, must be in the mistresses, and hers in the fires, without any remission. Everything was confirmed by the barber, and he considered it a good thing and a very correct thing because he understood that the priest was such a good Christian and such a friend of the truth, that he would not say anything else for all the world. And, opening another book, he saw that it was Palmerine de Oliva, and next to him was another called Palmerine de Ingalaterra, which seen by the lawyer, he said, that olive is then cracked and burned, that even the ashes do not remain and that palm from England be kept and preserved as a unique thing, and another box be made for it like the one Alexander found in the remains of Darius, who deputed it to keep the works of the poet Homer in it. This book, Sonor Compadre, has authority for two reasons, one, because it is very good in itself, and the other, because it is famous that a discreet king of Portugal composed it. All the adventures of the castle of Miragada are very beautiful and of great artifice, the reasons, courteous and clear, that keep and look at the decorum of the one who speaks with great propriety and understanding. I say, then, except for your good opinion, Mr. Master Nicolás, that he and Amadis de Gaula remain free from the fire, and all the others, without doing any more digging and tasting, perish. No, Sonor Compadre, replied the barber, that this one that I have here is the famous Don Belianus. Well, that one, replied the priest, with the second, third, and fourth parts, they need a little rhubarb to purge their excessive anger, and it is necessary to take away everything from the castle of fame and other more important impertinences, for which they are given an ultramarine term, and as they amend, so mercy or justice will be used with them, and in the meantime, keep them, my friend, in your house, but don't let anyone read them. That pleases me, replied the barber. And, not wanting to tire himself out reading books of chivalry, he ordered his mistress to take all the granda and put them in the corral. She did not call herself dumb or deaf, but rather to those who wanted more to burn him than to throw a cloth, 
no matter how big and thin it was, and, seizing almost eight at once, she flung them out of the window. By taking many together, one fell at the feet of the barber, who wanted to see whose it was, and saw that it said, History of the famous knight Tyrant the White. Valor may God, said the priest, giving a great voice. Here is Tarante el Blanco. Give it to me here, compadre. I realize that I have found in him a treasure of contentment and a mine of pastimes. Here is Don Quirialason de Montalbán, valiant knight, and his brother Tomás de Montalbán, and the knight Fonseca, with the battle that the brave man from Tarante waged with the Alano, and the wits of the maiden placer de Mivida, with the loves and lies of the repasada widow, and the lady empress, in love with Hippolito, his squire. I tell you the truth, senor compadre, that, due to its style, this is the best book in the world. Here the gentlemen eat, and sleep, and die in their beds, and make a will before their death, with these things that all the rest books of this genre are lacking. With all that, I tell you that he deserved the one he composed for him, since he did not do so many industrial foolishness that they would throw him to the galleys for all the days of his life. Take him home and read to him, and you will see that what I have told you about him is true. So it will be, replied the barber, but what shall we make of these little books that remain? These, said the priest, must not be about chivalry, but about poetry. And opening one, he saw that it was La Diana, by Jorge de Montemayor, and said, believing that all the others were of the same genre, these do not deserve to be burned, like the others, because they do not and will not do the damage that those of cavalry do have made which are books of understanding, without prejudice to third parties. O oh Lord! said the niece, your grace may as well have them burned, like the others, because it wouldn't be too much if, having been cured of my lord uncle's chivalrous disease, by reading these, he took the fancy of becoming a shepherd and wandering through the woods and meadows singing and ringing, and, what would be worse, to become a poet which, they say, is an incurable and catchy disease. This maiden says the truth, said the priest, and it will be well to take away from our friend this stumbling block and occasion in front of her. And, since we begin with La Diana de Montemayor, I am of the opinion that it should not be burned, but that everything that deals with the wise Felicia and enchanted water should be removed and almost all the major verses, and that the prose, and the honor of being first in such books. The next one, said the barber, is La Diana, called the second of Salmentino, and this one, another one that has the same name, whose author is Gil Polo. Well, that of Salmentino, replied the priest, accompany and increase the number of those condemned to the corral, and that of Gil Polo be kept as if it were Apollo himself. Come on ahead, Senor. Compadre, and let's hurry up, it's getting late. This book is said the barber, opening another the ten books of fortune of love, composed by Antonio de la Frasso, Sardinian poet. By the orders I received, said the priest, since Apollo was Apollo, and the muses, and the poetic poets, no book has been composed as graceful or as absurd as that one, and that, along its path, it is the best and the most unique of all those of this genre that have come to light in the world, and the one who has not read it can realize that he has never read a thing of pleasure. Give it to me here, compadre, what a price more to have found him than if they gave me a cassock from a Florentine slit. He put him aside with great pleasure, and the barber continued saying, These next are El Pasta de Iberia, Ninfas de Henares and Disappointments of Jealousy. Well, 
There's nothing else to do, said the priest, but hand him over to the mistress's secular arm, and don't ask me why, it would be never ending. This one that comes is El Pastor de Filida. It's not that shepherd, said the priest, but a very discreet courtier, he guard as a precious jewel. This great one that comes here is called, said the barber, treasure of various poems. As they were not so many, said the priest, they were more esteemed, it is necessary that this book be weeded and cleaned of some baseness that it has among its greatness. Be careful, because the author of it is a friend of mine, and out of respect for other more heroic and lofty works that he has written. This is, continued the barber, the songbook of Lopez Maldonado. The author of that book, too, replied the priest, is a great friend of mine, and his verses in his mouth amaze whoever hears them. And such is the softness of the voice with which he sings them, that it enchants. Something long is in the eclogues, but the good was never much. Keep yourself with the chosen ones. But what book is that next to him? La Galatea, by Miguel de Cervantes, said the barber. That Cervantes has been a great friend of mine for many years, and I know that he is more versed in misfortunes than in verses. His book has something of a good invention about it. He proposes something, and concludes nothing. It is necessary to wait for the second part that he promises. Perhaps with the amendment he will fully achieve the mercy that is now denied him. And while this is seen, keep him confined in your inn, senor compadre. That pleases me, replied the barber. And here come three, all together. La Araucana, by Don Alonso de Asilla, La Ostriada, by Juan Rufo, a Cordoba jury, and El Monserrato, by Cristobal de Verruez, a Valencian poet. All these three books, said the priest, are the best that are written in heroic verse in the Spanish language, and can compete with the most famous in Italy. Keep them as the richest pieces of poetry that Spain has. The priest got tired of seeing more books, and sir, with a closed charge, he wanted all the others to burn, but the barber already had one open, which was called Las Logramas. De Angelica, because its author was one of the famous poets of the world, not only of Spain, and he was very happy in the translation of some of Ovid's fables. Shout Don Quixote, saying, Here, here, Valiant knights, here it is necessary to show the strength of your valiant arms, that the courtiers have the best of the tournament. In resorting to this noise and din, he did not go any farther with the scrutiny of the other remaining books, and sir, it is believed that La Carolia and Leonda Espana, with Los Hechos del Emperador, composed by Don Luis de Orvilla, who undoubtedly must have been among those who remained, went to the fire without being seen or heard, and perhaps, if the priest saw them, they would not go through such a rigorous sentence. When they reached Don Quixote, he was already out of bed, and he continued in their voices and in his nonsense, stabbing and backhanding everywhere, being as awake as if he had never slept. They embraced him and by force they returned him to the bed, and, after he had calmed down a bit, turning to speak to the priest, he said to him, Indeed, Archbishop Turpin, it is a great loss for those of us who call ourselves twelve peers to allow, without further ado, to take the victory of this tournament to the courtly knights, having us the adventurers won the prize in the three preceding days. Shut up, your grace, senor compadre, said the priest, may God be served that luck changes, and that what is lost today may be gained tomorrow, and your grace take care of his health for now, for it seems to me that he must be too tired, if it is not already that he is badly injured, not wounded, 
said Don Quixote, but bruised and broken, there is no doubt about it, because that bastard Don Roldan has beaten me to death with the trunk of an oak tree, and all out of envy. Because he sees that I am only the opposite of his bravery. But I would not call myself Reynaldo's de Montalbán if, getting up from this bed, I did not repay it, despite all his enchantments, and, for now, bring me some food, which I know is what will do the most to me, and let me take revenge on myself. They did so. They gave him something to eat, and he fell asleep again, and they, amazed at his folly. That night the mistress burned and burned all the books that were in the yard and in the whole house, and they must have burned sitch that they deserved to be kept in perpetual archives, but her luck. And the scrutiny's laziness did not allow it. And thus, the proverb was fulfilled in him that sometimes the just pay for sinners. One of the remedies that the priest and the barber gave, at that time, for his friend's illness, was that they wall up and cover up the room with the books, so that when he got up he would not find them perhaps removing the cause, the effect would cease. And that they say that an enchanter had taken him, and the room and all, and so it was done with great alacrity. Two days later Don Quixote got up, and the first thing he did was go to see his books, and, as he could not find the room where he had left him, he went from one place to another looking for him. He would come to where he used to have the door, and feel it with his hands, and he would turn and roll his eyes at everything, without saying a word. But, after a long walk, he asked his mistress. Which way was his book room? The mistress, who was already well warned of what she had to answer, said to her, What room, or what nothing? is your grace looking for? There are no more rooms or books in this house, because the devil himself took everything. It wasn't the devil, replied the niece, but an enchanter who came on a cloud one night, after the day your grace left here, and, dismounting from a serpent on which he came as a knight, entered the room, and there was no I know what was done inside that after a few minutes it flew off the roof, leaving the house full of smoke, and when we agreed to look at what he had done, we saw neither a book nor any room. The only things that are well remembered are me and the mistress who, at the time that bad old man left, said in a loud voice that, due to a secret enmity she had with the owner of those books and room, she had left the damage done in that house that was later destroyed. Would see. She also said that his name was the wise Munnerton. Freston would say. Said Don Quixote. I don't know. Replied the mistress. If his name was Freston or Fritton. I only know that his name ended in a tone. That's right. Said Don Quixote. That this is a charming wise man. My great enemy who hates me, because he knows from his arts and letters that I have to come, as time goes on, to fight in singular battle with a gentleman whom he favours, and I have to defeat him, without him being able to get in the way, and for this reason he tries to make me all the trouble he can, and commanding him how badly he will be able to contradict or avoid what is ordered by heaven. Who doubts that? said the niece. But, who gets your grace, son or uncle, into those fights? Wouldn't it be better to stay peacefully in his house and not go around the world looking for looted bread, without considering that many go for wool and return shorn? Oh, my niece, replied Don Quixote, and how bad you are in the account. Before they shave me, I will have all those who imagine touching me at the tip of a single hair. Shaved and removed their beards. The two of them did not want to reply to him any more, because they saw that his anger was on fire. It is, then, the case that he spent fifteen days at home very calm, 
without showing any sign of wanting to second his first dalliances, during which days he spent hilarious stories with his two friends, the priest and the barber, about which he said that the thing what the world needed most was knights errant and for knight errantry to be resurrected in it. The priest sometimes contradicted him and other times he conceded, because if he did not keep this artifice, there would be no way to find out from him. At this time, he requested Don Quixote from a neighboring farmer, a good man, if this title can be given to someone who is poor, but with very little salt in his head. In short, he told him so much, persuaded him, and promised him so much, that the poor villain determined to get away with him and serve as his squire. Don Quixote told him, among other things, that he willingly get ready to go with him, because perhaps an adventure could happen to him that he would win, take those straws away from me, some island, and leave him as governor of it. With these promises and others like that, Sancho Panza, for that was the farmer's name, left his wife and children and became his neighbor's squire. He then gave Don Quixote the order to look for money, and, selling one thing and pawning another, and squandering them all, a reasonable amount arrived. He also made use of a buckler, which he borrowed from a friend of his, and, equipping his broken helmet as best he could, he informed his squire Sancho of the day and time that he intended to set out, so that he could make do with what he saw. What more was needed? Above all, he charged her to carry saddlebags, and he said that he would take it, and that he also intended to take a donkey that he had very good, because he was not used to walking much. Don Quixote paid a little attention to the matter of the donkey, imagining if he would remember if some knight errant had brought a knight squire as an asshole, but none ever came to mind. But, with all this, he determined that he would take him with the assumption of accommodating him with more honorable cavalry when there was an opportunity for it, taking the horse from the first impolite gentleman he met. He provided himself with shirts and other things that he could, according to the advice that the innkeeper had given him, all of which done and accomplished, without Panza saying goodbye to his sons and his wife, nor Don Quixote to his mistress and niece, one night they left the place without anyone seeing them, in which they walked so much, that at dawn they were sure that they would not find them even if they looked for them. Sancho Panza rode on his donkey like a patriarch, with his saddle bags and his boot, and with great desire to see himself already governor of the island that his master had promised him. Don Quixote decided to take the same route and road that he had taken on his first trip, which was through the Campo de Montiel, through which he walked with less regret than the last time, because being the time of the morning and the rays of the sun hit them sideways, they were not fatigued. At this Sancho Panza said to his mistress, Look at your grace, gentlemen errant, don't forget what you have promised me about the island that I will know how to govern it, no matter how great it is. To which Don Quixote replied, You must know, friend Sancho Panza, that it was a very common custom of ancient knights errant to make their squires governors of the islands or kingdoms they won, and I am determined that for my sake no lack of so grateful usage. Before, I think I will outdo myself in it because they sometimes, and perhaps most, waited until their squires were old, and, after being fed up with serving and having had bad days and worse nights, they gave them some title of count, or, at most, of marquis, of some valley or province from little more to less, but, if you live, and I live, it could well be that before six days I won such a kingdom that I would have other adherents to it, who would come from mold to crown you king of one of them. And don't worry too much, things and cases happen to such gentlemen, in ways so never seen or thought of, 
that I could easily give you even more than I promise. In this way, replied Sancho Panza, if I were king by some miracle that your grace says, at least Juana Gutierrez, hear me, she would become queen, and my children infants. Well, who doubts it? replied Don Quixote. I doubt it, replied Sancho Panza, because I believe that, even if God rained down kingdoms on earth, none of them would settle well on the head of Mari Gutierrez. No, sir, that it is not worth two Maravedis for a queen, Countess will like him better, and even God and help. Commend it to God, Sancho, replied Don Quixote, and he will give what is best for him, but do not lower your spirits so much that you come to be content with less than being advanced. I won't. My lord, answered Sancho, and more so having such a principal master in your grace, who will know how to give me everything that is good for me and that I can carry. Other events worthy of happy remembrance in this, they discovered thirty or forty windmills that are in that field, and as soon as Don Quixote saw them, he said to his squire, Fate is guiding our affairs better than we could hope for, because you see there, friend Sancho Panza, where thirty or a few more are discovered, outrageous giants, with who I plan to do battle and take away from all the lives, with whose spoils we will begin to enrich, that this is a good war, and it is a great service of God to remove such bad seeds from the face of the earth. What giants, said Sancho Panza. Those you see there, replied his mistress, with long arms, which some usually have almost two leagues long. Look, your grace, replied Sancho, those that look alike there are not giants, but windmills, and what in them look like arms are the blades, which, turned by the wind, make the millstone move. It seems well, answered Don Quixote, that you are not trained in this adventure. They are giants, and if you are afraid, get out of there, and pray in the space that I am going to enter with them in a fierce and unequal battle. And, saying this, he spurred his horse Racinant, without heeding the shouts that his squire Sancho gave him, warning him that, without a doubt, those he was going to attack were windmills, and not giants. Dot. But he was so focused on the fact that they were giants, that he neither heard the voices of his squire Sancho nor did he see, although he was already very close to him, what they were, before, he was saying in loud voices, don't run away, cowards and vile creatures, because only one gentleman is the one who attacks you. At this point a little wind picked up and the great blades began to move, which Don Quixote, seeing, said, Well, even if you move more arms than those of the giant Briero, you will pay me back. And, saying this, and commending himself wholeheartedly to his lady Dulcinea, asking her to help him in such a situation, well covered in his buckler, with his lance at the ready, he charged at Rossinant's full gallop and charged with the first mill, which was ahead, and, giving him a lance in the blade, the wind returned it with such fury that he tore the lance to pieces, taking with him the horse and the knight, who was rolling badly battered. Across the field, Sancho Panza ran to help him, as fast as his donkey could run, and when he arrived he found that he could not move, such was the blow that Racinant gave him. Valor may God, said Sancho. Didn't I tell your grace to take a good look at what he was doing, that they were nothing but windmills, and could not be known except by someone who carried other such things on his head? Hush! Friend Sancho, replied Don Quixote, the affairs of war, more than others, are subject to continuous change. What's more, I think, and it's true, that the wise Freston who stole my room and my books has turned these giants into windmills to take away the glory of their victory. 
Sich is the enmity he has me. But, after all, their bad arts have little power against the goodness of my sword. God do it as he can, replied Sancho Panza. And, helping him to get up, he climbed back on Racinant, who was half back. And, talking about the past adventure, they followed the road to Puerto Lopez, because their Don Quixote said that it was impossible not to find many and diverse adventures, because it was a very fleeting place. But he was very regretful for having lacked the spear. And, telling his squire, he said, I remember reading that a Spanish knight named Diego Perez de Vargas, having broken his sword in battle, tore off a heavy branch or trunk from an oak tree, and with it did such things. Things that day, and he crushed so many moors, that he was left with the nickname Machuca, and thus he and his descendants were called, from that day on, Vargas and Machuca. I plan to break off another trunk just as good as that one, that I imagine and intend to do such feats with it, that you consider yourself lucky to have deserved to come to see them and witness things that can hardly be believed. A la mano de Dios, said Sancho. I believe everything as your grace says it, but straighten up a bit, it looks like it's going to the side, and it must be from the moment you fell. Sitch is the truth, answered Don Quixote. And if I don't complain about the pain, it's because knights errant are not allowed to complain about any wound, even if the guts spill out of it. If that's sir, I don't have anything to reply to, replied Sancho, but God knows if I'd be happy that your grace complained when something hurt you. I know how to say that I have to complain about the smallest pain I have, if the squires of knights errant don't understand that not complaining. Don Quixote did not stop laughing at the simplicity of his squire, and sir, so, he declared to her that he could very well complain, as and when he wanted, without desire or with her, that until then he had not read anything to the contrary in the order of chivalry. Sancho told him to see that it was time to eat. His mistress replied that at that time he did not need it. Let him eat when he wanted. With this license, Sancho made himself comfortable on his donkey as best he could, and taking out of the saddlebags what he had put in him, he walked and ate behind his From time to time he tipped his boot, with such pleasure, that the most gifted winemaker in Malaga could envy him. And while he was drinking like that, that he couldn't remember any promise that his mistress had made him, nor did he think it was any job, but rather a lot of rest, to Be go looking for adventures, no matter how dangerous they were. In conclusion, they spent that night among some trees, and from one of them Don Quixote tore off a dry branch that could almost serve as a spear and he placed in it the iron that he had taken from the, priest, the one that had broken. Mine, Don Quixote did not sleep all that night, thinking of his lady Dulcinea, to conform to what he had read in his books, when knights spent many sleepless nights in the woods and deserts, entertained by the memories of their mistresses. Sancho Panza did not have it like that, since, since his stomach was full, and not with chicory water, he carried it all away in a dream, and the rays of the sun, which fell on his face, nor the song of the birds, which, many and very joyfully, greeted the coming of the new day, would not have been part of waking him up, if his mistress did not call him. When he got up he gave the boot a try, and found it a little skinnier than the night before, and his heart grieved, for it seemed to him that they were not on the way to remedy his fault so quickly. Don Quixote did not want to have breakfast, because, as has been said, he began to sustain himself on tasty memories. They returned to their journey to Puerto Lopez, and around three o'clock in the day they discovered him. Here, said Don Quixote, seeing him, we can, 
Brother Sancho Panza, stick our hands up to our elbows in what they call adventures. But warn me that, even if you see me in the greatest dangers in the world, you should not put your hand to your sword to defend me, if you no longer see that those who offend me are scoundrels and low people, that in such a case you can help me. But if they were knights, in no way is it lawful or granted by the laws of chivalry that you help me, until you are knighted. By the way, sir, answered Sancho, may your grace be very well obeyed in this, and more, that I myself am peaceful and an enemy of getting into noise or quarrels. It is true that, when it comes to defending my person, I will not have much regard for those laws, since the divine and human laws allow each one to defend himself from whoever wants to offend him. I say no less, answered Don Quixote, but, in this matter of helping me against knights, you must keep your natural impetus at bay. I say that I will do so, replied Sancho, and that I will keep that precept as well as on Sunday. While in these words, two friars of the Order of San Benito, knights on two dromedaries, appeared. On the road, they were no smaller than the two mules on which they came. They brought their cravings road and sun umbrellas. Behind them came a carriage, with four or five horsemen accompanying it, and two mule boys on foot. As was later learned, a Biscayan lady was coming in the car, who was going to Seville, where her husband was, who was going to the Indies with a very honorable position. The friars did not come with her, although they were going the same way, but as soon as Don Quixote caught sight of them, he said to his squire, either I am deceiving myself, or this must be the most famous adventure that has ever been seen, because those black shapes that appear there must be, and are without a doubt, some enchanters who have stolen a princess in that carriage, and it is necessary to undo this one-eyed man with all my might. This will be worse than the windmills, said Sancho. Look, sir, those are friars from San Benito, and the car must belong to some passing people. Look what I say to take a good look at what he does, don't let the devil deceive you. I have already told you, Sancho, answered Don Quixote, that you know little of adventurous infirmities, what I say is true, and now you will see it. And, saying this, he went ahead and stood in the middle of the path where the friars were coming from, and, coming so close that it seemed to him that they might hear what he said, he said in a loud voice, devilized and enormous people, immediately leave the high princesses that you have forced in that carriage. If not, get ready to receive speedy death, for just punishment of your bad deeds. The friars held the reins and were amazed, both at the figure of Don Quixote and at his reasons, to which they responded, Sir Knight, we are not devilish or colossal, but too religious of San Benito who are going our way, and we don't know if any forced princesses come in this car or not. There are no soft words for me, since I already know you, you feigned scoundrel, said Don Quixote. And, Without waiting for any further response, he pricked Racinant and, with his spear lowered, charged at the first friar with such fury and courage that if the friar did not let himself fall off the mule, he would make him fall to the ground unwillingly. And even badly injured, if he did not drop dead. The second religious, who saw the way they treated his companion, put legs on the castle of his good mule and began to run through that countryside, faster than the wind itself. Sancho Panza, who saw the friar on the ground, getting off his donkey slightly, rushed at him and began to remove his habits. At this point two young men from the friars arrived and asked him why he was undressing him. Sancho replied that it fell to him legitimately, 
as the spoils of the battle that his lord Don Quixote had won. The young men, who did not know how to make jokes, nor did they understand what was said about plunder or battles, seeing that Don Quixote was already away from there, talking to those who were coming in the carriage, attacked Sancho and hit him on the ground, and, leaving no hair on his beard, they kicked him to the ground and left him stretched out on the ground, breathless and senseless. And, without pausing for a moment, the friar went up again, all fearful and cowardly and without color in his face, and, when he saw himself on horseback, he dived after his companion, who was waiting for him a good distance from there, and waiting for what that shock would stop, and, not wanting to wait for the end of all that begun event, they continued on their way, making more crosses than if they were carrying the devil on their backs. Don Quixote was, as has been said, talking to the lady in the carriage, saying to her, Your beauty, my lady, can do whatever suits her best with her person, because the pride of your thieves already lies on the ground, knocked down by this my strong arm. And, so that you do not suffer to know the name of your liberator, know that my name is Don Quixote de la Mancha, knight errant and adventurer, and captive of the peerless and beautiful Dona Dulcinea del Toboso, and, in return for the benefit you have received from me, I want nothing more than that you return to Toboso, and that you appear before this lady on my behalf and tell her what I have done for your freedom. All this that Don Quixote was saying was listened to by one of the squires who accompanied the carriage, who was from Biscay, who, seeing that he did not want to let the carriage go ahead, but said, that he would then have to go around El Toboso, went to Don Quixote and, seizing him by the lance, said to him, in bad Spanish and worse Biscayan language, Dest away. Come on, gentlemen that you walk badly. By the God who raised me, if you don't leave a car, that's how you kill yourself as you are there, a Biscayan. Don Quixote understood him very well and very calmly he replied, If you were a knight, as you are not, I would already have punished your foolishness and audacity, captive creature. To which the Biscayan replied, Not me, a gentleman. I swear to God you lie as a Christian. If you throw a throw and a sword you draw, how quickly will you see that the cat is carrying the water? Biscayan by land, Hidalgo by sea, Hidalgo by the devil. And you lie, look if you say something. Else, now you will see it, said Agrajesh. Replied Don Quixote. And, throwing the spear on the ground, he drew his sword and clutched his buckler, and attacked the Biscayan with the determination to take his life. The Biscayan, who saw him coming like this, even though he wanted to get off the mule, which, because it was one of the bad ones for hire, was not to be trusted, could not do anything else but draw the sword from it. But it was good for him that he found himself next to the car, from where he was able to take a pillow that served as a shield, and then they went towards each other, as if they were two mortal enemies. The rest of the people would like to put them in peace, but they could not, because the Biscayan said in his ill-conceived arguments that if they did not let him finish his battle, he himself would kill his mistress and all the people who stood in his way. The lady in the carriage, amazed and fearful of what she saw, made the coachman move away from there a little, and from a distance she began to watch the rigorous contest, in the course of which the Biscayan gave Don Quixote a great knife, over one shoulder, over the buckler, which, to give it to him without defense, would open up to the waist. Don Quixote, who felt the grief of that unbridled blow, gave a loud voice, saying, O lady of my soul, Dulcinea, flower of beauty, help this knight of yours, who, 
to satisfy your great goodness, in this rigorous trance is found. Saying this, and tightening his sword, and covering himself well with his buckler, and attacking the Biscayan, all happened at once, taking the determination to venture everything with a single blow. The Biscayan, who saw him coming against him in this way, well understood by his boldness his courage, and determined to do the same as Don Quixote, and so, he waited for him well covered with his pillow, unable to surround the mule to one side or the other. Now, from sheer exhaustion and not used to such childish things, he couldn't take a step. So, as has been said, Don Quixote came against the cautious Biscayan, with his sword held high, determined to open him in the middle, and the Biscayan was waiting for him likewise, his sword raised, and his pillow wrapped around him and all those bystanders were fearful, and hung up on what was to happen from those huge blows with which they threatened each other, and the lady in the carriage and the other servants of hers were making a thousand wishes and offerings to all the images and houses of devotion in Spain, that God free his squire and them from that great danger in which they found themselves. But there is the damage of all this that at this point and end the author of this story leaves this battle pending, apologizing that he did not find more writing about these exploits of Don Quixote than the ones he leaves referred to. It is true that the second author of this work did not want to believe that such a curious story was delivered to the laws of oblivion, nor that the wits of La Mancha had not been so incurious that they did not have in their files or on their desks some papers that reveal famous gentlemen treated, and sir, with this imagination, he did not despair of finding the end of this peaceful story, which, being favorable heaven, found him in the way that will be told in the second part. Point nine chapter where the stupendous battle is concluded and brought to an end that the gallant Biscayan and the Valiant man from La Mancha had we left in the first part of this story the valiant Biscayan and the famous Don Quixote with their swords high and drawn, in the guise of unloading too furious. Fendantus, such that, if they were hit squarely, at least the less they would split and fend from top to bottom and split open like a grenade, and that at that doubtful point such a delicious story stopped and was undone without its author giving us any notice where what was missing could be found. This caused me a lot of grief, because the pleasure of having read so little turned into disgust, thinking of the bad path that offered itself to find what, in my opinion, was missing from such a tasty story. It seemed to me an impossible thing and out of all good custom that such a good knight would have lacked some wise man to take charge of writing his never-before-seen feats, something that none of the knights errant lacked, of which people say they go to their adventures, because each of them had one or two wise men, like a mold, who not only wrote down their deeds, but also painted their smallest thoughts and trifles, no matter how hidden they were, and such a good knight should not be so unfortunate that he lacked what platter and others like him had in excess. And sir, I could not incline myself to believe that such a gallant story had been left crippled and spoiled, and he blamed the malignancy of time, devourer and consumer of all things, which either had her hidden or consumed. On the other hand, it seemed to me that, since among his books there had been such
Hola amigos, ¿qué tal estáis? Como habéis podido ver, hemos estado escuchando un texto en inglés, el Quijote, y gracias a él mmm, hay mucho vocabulario que entra en nuestra mente y que, y que nos va a ayudar bastante a, a mejorar nuestro nivel de inglés. Vamos a hacer una pequeña pausa y vamos a continuar con un poco de música para descansar luego seguimos con más inglés Baby 